Near the harbor late at night, a gathering of impeccably dressed men surrounded a figure seated against a wall, visibly struggling, his shirt stained with bleeding wounds. This individual, identified as Park Kang Tae, grappled with intense pain from his injuries. Among the group, a man with a distinct scar across his mouth granted Kang Tae a brief moment to smoke his final cigarette. Kang Tae, in gratitude, took a drag from the cigarette offered to him. The scar-faced man instructed his bald associate to swiftly dispatch Kang Tae's brother with a single strike. The bald man, kneeling beside Kang Tae, held a knife and addressed him with familial affection, expressing regret. Kang Tai, finishing his cigarette, acknowledged the situation as compliance with orders. In a contemplative moment, Kang Tai reflected on a life marred by anger and despair, despite his deep emotional attachment to boxing. He possessed all the qualities, height, strength, and star potential, to become a promising boxing prospect during his high school years. However, his inability to control youthful impulses led to confrontations he couldn't evade. The outcome of one such confrontation resulted in a severe injury, a metal bat striking his hand, leaving it mangled and incapacitated. This injury shattered Kang Tae's dreams of a boxing career, leaving him sidelined and desolate. As he ruminated on potential comebacks and alternative paths, he acknowledged the futility of dwelling on regret at this stage. The knife pierced deep into his body, causing him to clench his teeth in agony. Thoughts raced through his mind. If only I could have another chance, just one more shot at boxing. These were his final contemplations before closing his eyes for the last time. Amidst voices calling out for someone named Callie to wake up and speculating about death, a sense of confusion enveloped Park Kong Tae. As he questioned the identities being discussed, attention shifted to a slight blonde boy lying on the ground, blood pooling around him while a group of youngsters fled. Initially lifeless, the boy's eyes suddenly widened, sparking a resurgence of vitality. Rising abruptly, he examined his trembling hands. Kang Tai, believing he had succumbed to the stabbing, puzzled over his new form. This was Kali. A man faced a group, explaining that losers of a match would head to the mine, while winners remained at August Boxing Apprentice School. He cautioned them to train fiercely or face the mine. Assigning pairs, the man named Nixar, an instructor, paired Torres and Meros, Undat and Bizan, Kizo and Damien, Johnny and Caesar, and lastly, Slit and Cali for a match in a week. Stronger contenders chuckled, assured of victory, while the weaker ones questioned the instructor's intentions, feeling as if they were being sent to their demise. Cali sensed the plan to pit superior against inferior. Aware of the dangers of the mine, where deaths from accidents or lung disease were common even in the 21st century, Cali resolved to avoid it at any cost. Suddenly, Nixar summoned him separately causing discontent among the others who perceived favoritism toward Kali, despite his struggle to keep up with training. As Kali knelt before Nixar, seated on tree roots, the instructor revealed he had put forward Kali's name for discharge. Shocked, yet surprisingly composed, Kali understood his small stature meant death in the mine or a short life as a boxer. Nixar suggested selling Kali to a different master, but Kali refused, determined to compete in the upcoming match. Astonished by Kali's resolve, Nixar questioned if this was the same Kali who would usually break down in tears. Exhibiting a fighting spirit and intense determination, Kali affirmed his aspiration to become a boxer. Nixar smiles, saying little but offering Kali the chance to return if he changes his mind. Their meeting ends as Kali mulls over Nixar's question about his true identity. He isn't Kali. Not long ago, he was a gangster named Park Kang Taeyong on Earth. Now, reborn as Kali, he has a fresh start, a chance to pursue boxing. But this new body is frail, with feeble bones and low stamina. Late growth spurt, weak punches, these are his new limitations. Moreover, it seems Kali is a target for bullying, likely due to his fragile physique. Expecting trouble from a group, Kali braces himself. Suddenly, a forceful punch lands on his face, and a larger boy continues the assault resenting Kali for being favored by the instructor and bragging about his father's championship. As the beating continues, another bystander, initially finding Kali pathetic, is surprised to see him still standing, unlike before. Struggling to rise, Kali ponders the sorry state of this body's owner. The bully taunts Kali, threatening to disfigure him within a week. However, Kali retorts, predicting the bully's fate in the mine. 
Enraged, the bully lunges with a massive swing. Realizing he can't confront it head-on with his weak body, Callie strategizes. Suddenly, an unexpected phenomenon occurs. Time seems to slow down, allowing Callie to narrowly evade the blow with newfound agility. Astonished by his evasion, even Callie is surprised. The boy observing from the tree also notices this remarkable feat. The big boy swings again, but Callie realizes that what he saw wasn't an illusion. He can predict the fist's trajectory. His eyes give him the power to dodge past the big boy's swing, getting closer with each evasion. After dodging, Callie surprises everyone by landing a punch on the big boy. But the big boy, angry at being caught off guard, grabs Callie's shirt, leading to his defeat by the bullies. Lying on the ground, Callie can't help but laugh. Gripping the ground with his fist, he questions why he didn't notice sooner. The crucial boxing elements, hand coordination and reflexes. His coordination can track every grain of falling sand and dodge punches. Remembering his past boxing knowledge, Callie is confident he won't end up in the mine. Determined with his toughened fist, he's set on surviving. Twenty years ago, the kingdom faced an uprising by armored gladiators. Even regular troops struggled against this rebellion, leading to the abolition of the slave gladiator system. This birthed fighters who aimed to entertain the audience by defeating opponents with bare fists, an insight Callie discovers about fighters in this world. During morning exercise, Callie realizes his current body's vulnerability. Another fighter suggests he run slowly if exhausted, but Callie insists on pushing through, coughing heavily. Survival here demands strength, and Callie knows he has to do whatever it takes. The run ends, and as Callie struggles, he ponders his weak body, contrasting it with his past self's stamina despite drinking and smoking. Nixar notices Callie, usually lagging, now in the middle of the pack. Curious about the change, Nixar wonders what has transformed Callie. He catches wind of two fellow fighters discussing Callie's vigorous run today and his altered behavior post a head injury. This piques Nixar's interest, prompting him to inquire about it. To his surprise, he discovers that Callie had been savagely assaulted by another group. The two fighters describe the severity of the beating, detailing extensive bleeding from his head to his nose, almost suggesting a near-fatal situation. Upon learning this, Nixer ponders the impact of Callie's near-death experience, deciding to observe him further. The fighters resume their afternoon training routine, engaging in push-ups and log-carrying exercises. Observing everyone's determination to avoid the mine, Callie focuses on practicing punches on a dummy, only to realize its ineffectiveness. Reflecting on his previous successful punch to the big boy's stomach, he recognizes his current body's incapability to inflict significant harm. He strategizes to aim for the jaw, to secure a decisive victory. A senior fighter interrupts Callie's training, questioning his unorthodox approach. Callie defends his method, challenging why they couldn't adopt a different training style. Infuriated, the senior rebukes Callie, emphasizing the importance of slugger-type boxing prevalent in their world. Distinct from Callie's previous training regimen. Despite the senior's insistence on log training, Nixar steps in questioning Callie about using his father's training techniques. Affirming this, Callie learns he can apply his champion-style training within their camp. Nixar marvels at Callie's transformation, wondering if Caviron, Callie's father, imparted additional techniques. Observing Callie closely, Nixar senses a profound and remarkable change in his demeanor. As the sun starts to go down, Callie leans on a tree, feeling tired and worn out from training. He believed he was too weak for it. Suddenly, his stomach rumbled, craving something sweet. Looking up, he spotted an apple tree behind him. Climbing up and biting into an apple, Callie instantly felt recharged, full of life. Unexpectedly, a voice startled him, belonging to a red-haired noble lady. She asked what he was doing up there. Struggling to respond, she simply asked him to pick an apple for her as she wanted one too. Obediently, he handed her an apple. While she ate, she praised him and questioned if he was a slave from the training camp. Before he could answer, she warned him about the garden belonging to a noble family, explaining the consequences if he got caught. This surprised Callie. He hadn't known. Concerned about getting injured and being unable to compete, he was startled to learn she was Baron Gadolf Agest's daughter, his master. Introducing herself as Azalea Agest, she prompted Callie to reveal his name. Azalea decided to let him off this time for giving her an apple, 
but cautioned that if caught again, she'd personally administer punishment. She made a playful remark about swinging the whip herself. Kindly, she advised him to leave before others saw him. Thanking her, Callie left, realizing how close it was. Azalea, noticing his small stature, couldn't help but ponder over his name while holding the apple he gave her. The next day, Callie returned to training, practicing punches and footwork with determination. The stronger boy who had beaten him noticed Callie's transformation, realizing he was gaining attention with his rigorous training. Remembering that Callie had landed a strike on him before, he knew that if Callie kept this up, it would be his downfall. Out of frustration, the big boy throws his log onto the ground angrily, asking his friend if the instructors were coming. The friend tells him that the master had called for them and left. Upon hearing that, Slit thought that it was right for him to show Callie who his boss was right now. So, he decides to start with his annoying face, hoping to smash Callie onto the ground. But much to his surprise, our boy manages to dodge his sneaky attack, twisting his foot on the ground, and with his fist primed for action, Callie returns a swift uppercut to Slit's chin, but stops his fist just inches away from the chin. Callie immediately apologizes to Slit explaining to him that he was so focused that he didn't notice that he was beside him. So he asks him if he had hit his face. Slit tells him that he was fine. That's a relief, said Callie, as he gave Slit the biggest, bombastic side eye, telling him that he shouldn't get hurt before the match. And the crazy look in his eyes caused Slit to tremble and sweat profusely. And so, our boy happily tells him that he was going back to what he was doing, leaving Slit unable to respond back at all. Callie knew that he was a bastard since his time in the organization where he saw his share of guys like him, those who try to act tough by making others look weak. He crushed them all. As Torres squats with a heavy load, he thought that it wasn't a coincidence. So, he approaches Slit, telling him that he looked pale and worried. But Slit immediately shouts at Torres, telling him that he wasn't worried at all, just that he was lucky to have Callie as his opponent. Torres tells Slit that Callie had genuinely changed from his old whiny ways that resulted in beatings. Torres saw real determination in Callie's eyes now. He cautions Slit not to be careless against Callie. Slit feels hurt that even Torres was praising Callie now. Torres encourages Slit not to worry and to defeat Callie. Feeling reassured, Slit eagerly vows to beat Callie. The instructors gathered at nobleman Gadolf Auguste's mansion to oversee the match preparations. Gadolf notices promising boxer Torres' name on the participant list and asks instructor Nixar about him. Nixar says Torres has good balance of strength and agility, is aggressive and skilled, can overcome weaknesses, and has potential to become champion. Gadolf says the training center's reputation and finances have declined, forcing half the boxers into the mines as slaves. To raise money, he wants to invite commoners to watch the matches and asks Nixar to put on a quality show. Nixar thinks Gadolf's greed caused the downfall. Gadolf inherited the center 15 years ago and sustained it 5 years with his inherited boxers. But for the next 10 years he overused them until they died out. With insufficient farmland, the center's income funded the August territory. But now even that has become inadequate. Two years ago, Gadolf foolishly sent young boxers who were badly beaten at the Kingdom Tournament, which angered Nixar as he thinks the center could have revived otherwise. Just then, Azalea tells her father that she wanted to watch the match too. Her father was surprised to hear this as he knew that she hated it before because it was barbaric. But Azalea tells him that sometimes barbaric things were okay too. But Nixar was afraid that it might be too stimulating for the young miss. But she simply tells him that stimulating means fun. Gadolf laughs at her reply while she thought about how she wasn't usually interested in fights like those. But this time, she wanted to see something for herself about how well Callie would fight. Now it is the day of the fight. An arena was set up in the middle, surrounded by stands filled with spectators. As Callie wraps his hand in bandages and heads out into the arena, he thinks about how the time has come. That's it for video. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for next part.